What's up guys, it's DDP back with another quick Big 12 roundup for you just to give you an update as to what happened with Big 12 this week and the huge upset of course, right there you see it in the thumbnail behind me, Oklahoma State hosting Texas, the Pokes get it done, upsetting Texas 38-35. to This was a wild game because you have Oklahoma State race out to that early lead and Texas in the second half seemed to figure things out. Even though Texas fell behind as much as 17 in the first half, they really seemed to settle in in the second half and just start chipping away at that Oklahoma State lead. And where everything seemed to fall apart for Texas was late in the fourth quarter. Oklahoma State was able to flip field position beautifully, pinning Texas back deep, deep in inside its own five-yard line. Almost, in fact, getting a safety on the very first play from scrimmage after that. But instead, Oklahoma State is able to flip the field, start their, essentially, game-winning drive from... Now, let me correct that. It's not a game-winning drive. This was the score that put them up 10 late in the game. So it effectively was the dagger, is a better way to put it. But it sets up Oklahoma State in Texas territory to start. Oklahoma State grinds the clock down, and then on a gritty third and goal from the 10-yard line, Cornelius runs it in, gets the score to put them up 10. Texas would drive all the way down and get a touchdown, but they would fail to recover the onside kick, and they would fail to force Oklahoma State to punt. Oklahoma State immediately gets a first down, ices the clock, and that's the game. So here, here's a quick rundown of the stats here. Texas... Now with their second loss before November, they fall out of first place for the Big 12, moving Oklahoma back into first place. But Ellinger, for his effort, 22 of 42, 283 and two touchdowns. Now, he completed only about 50% of his passes, a little over, but for the most part, I don't know how much the shoulder was bothering him, but he did not look his usual self to me in this game. He still had the... He still rose to the big moment and made some big plays that really gave Texas a chance to steal this one, but it didn't look quite like the same guy we had seen prior to that. Uh, for the Texas running game, Ingram, 11 carries, 52 yards. Ellinger, 10 for 47, both touchdowns as well. So Ellinger had four touchdowns on the day, so that's why I don't want to knock the guy too much. He still had a stellar game. The only thing that wasn't quite on the same page was his passing attack in general. But other than that, man, Texas, not a lot of guys really popped off the page for you here. You had Humphrey go four for 69 from the receiving side, and you had Johnson go another five for 65 as well. So very uneven performance uh, beyond Ellinger, I felt, for Texas. That defense got torched early by Oklahoma State. Uh, let me get to that here. Cornelius goes 23 of 34 for 321 and three touchdowns. You have Justice Hill going 23 carries for 92 yards. So he got going a little bit. Not huge numbers. Still four on average, though pretty efficient. And Hubbard, nine for 80. So he's averaging basically nine yards a pop. That's huge. Uh, and then the receiver that broke the game open for Oklahoma State was Wallace. Ten catches, 222 yards, and two touchdowns. He is the reason Oklahoma State built that massive lead to start the game and Texas had no answer for him in the first half they got him a little more under control in the second half but he had a buck 60 at half so I mean better than a buck 60 at half so it was really a situation where Texas just dug itself too big of a hole to really be able to climb out of that as I said Texas falls to two now in the big 12 Oklahoma back into sole possession of first place this is going to be interesting to see how this goes. Texas is still in the thick of the Big 12 title race. They still have West Virginia they're going to match up with. Oklahoma still has West Virginia to match up with. So nothing is off the table within the conference. This is just a blow to Texas's chances at the college football playoff. There is no way a two-loss Big 12 team will get in. So Oklahoma has everything to lose at this point if they can't win out. Because whether or not they win the division or, excuse me, the conference, is irrelevant. They're the only team in the Big 12 still fighting for a playoff spot, effectively, as of now. Elsewhere, you have Kansas beating TCU. Do you believe me now that TCU is in complete freefall? Because they're in complete freefall. TCU has lost something like five games now in a row, 
They should have beaten Ohio State, let it get away late. They should have beaten Texas, failed to execute down the stretch. They got manhandled by Oklahoma. They got beaten by Kansas. There's probably another one in there somewhere that I'm missing. I feel like there's a week I'm not accounting for. Texas Tech, there you go, 17-14. So at least that one they held close, but TCU has lost five straight games. This was a team many believed was going to be in the thick of the race for the, for the Big 12 championship. So to see them lose five straight in the middle of the season, it, it's bad, man. They're in complete free fall. I don't know what else to say about them. Collins, the guy who went in last week during the OU game, uh, replacing Robinson at quarterback. He goes 23 of 33, 351, one touchdown, one pick. Anderson on the ground, 20 carries for 95 yards. Uh, Rieger at receiver goes eight catches, 177 yards and a touchdown. So that's nice. They got some decent production out of the offense here, but again, only 20, 26 points. That's, especially in this conference, not going to get it done most weeks. Apparently, even against Kansas, it's not good enough. Kansas, men, meanwhile, with Bender, 19 of 29, 249 and two touchdowns. Herbert on the ground, 21 for 38. That's an abysmal sub two yards a carry average, but he at least got a touchdown. Kansas' rushing attack was nothing in this game. Williams, the receiver, goes seven catches, 102 yards and two touchdowns. So there you go. There's your combination that beats them. Now, this was at Kansas. I guess that's slightly better, obviously, than if it happened at TCU. But holy crap, even if this game had occurred at TCU, I'm still not even sure that the Horned Frogs would have won this game. That's how bad their free fall is at this point. Nothing else really to say there. Uh, in Ames, Iowa, you have Iowa State beating Texas Tech 40-31. to Texas Tech has been one of the really good teams to watch in the Big 12 this year. They are 5-3 and three now, however. So any hope they had of going to the Big 12 championship game is pretty much dashed at this point. That said, they still have Texas and Oklahoma on their schedule, so it will be interesting to see how they fare against kind of the class of the Big 12 in that regard. They played they played West Virginia well when they played them. I think they lost by like 14, but they were really in that game for a while, had a chance. So, hey, no, no disrespect to Texas Tech. They If they're building on something, then... You know, maybe they'll be really good next year, and they might finally have a really good team under Cliff Kingsbury and not just a talented offensive team. For Tech, Bowman goes 32 of 56, one touchdown, three picks, only 5.8 yards an attempt. Not going to get it done. Ward on the ground, 10 carries, 16 yards. Ouch. <laughs> that's, that's brutal. So the Texas Tech rushing game that I had praised in previous weeks, saying, hey, if they get that element of their offense going, watch out. They didn't have that for crap in this game, it looks like. No no running back had better than two and a half yards a carry on average. They only, as a team, had about 25 rushes, it looks like, spread out across the quarterback, two running backs, and a fullback. So, yeah, that's not going to get it done. Meanwhile, through the air, Wesley goes eight catches, 119 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, High goes six for 70. Yeah, a really disappointing loss for sure for Texas Tech. But, you know, I, I warned against Iowa State, even with a slow start, they're better than people give them credit for. And if you're not ready with your A game, and especially if you have to go Ames, ooh, you, you got to be ready if you're going to survive that onslaught, let alone get the win. Purdy goes 13 of 27 for 250 and two touchdowns. Montgomery on the ground, 33 carries, 125 yards and two touchdowns. He was the real X factor here. Purdy also goes 14 carries for 47 yards. Hakeem Butler, four for 148 and a touchdown. I keep saying this, I really like Hakeem Butler. I think he is a very good third, fourth round receiver product or prospect, I should say, uh, in this next draft. I believe he's eligible. I'd have, I'd have to double check that, but I want to say that he is eligible for the draft. If not, then maybe you got one more year. But I really like what I see out of Butler for sure. Uh, Milton also gives you 7 for 89 on the Iowa State receiving game. So yes, very, very close game there. But Texas Tech can't get it done quite. And the receiving game, ironically, for Iowa State is what they can't deal, deal with. The X factor that put them in their place. Meanwhile, West Virginia rebounds and just oof, molly wops the hell out of Baylor 58-14 at West Virginia. I'm not putting a lot of stock in that. 
again, West Virginia is the dark horse for the Big 12 race this year. They still have OU and Texas on their schedule. I will be really curious to see how they match up with them. Regardless, they have a real shot as long as they don't trip up. As long as they beat one of those two now, they'll have a really good shot at being in the Big 12 title game and getting a rematch with the other, or maybe it's the one they beat. Who knows? But they'll have a shot at doing it. Well, no. It'll be who they lost to. They'll have a chance at the rematch because all three have one loss now in the season. So really interesting to see. Let me run real quick through this. I'm only going to touch on the West Virginia stats. Will Greer, 17 of 27, 353, three touchdowns. That's nice. Uh, good bounce back for him. Again, he's eliminated at a Heisman race as far as I'm concerned after that 100-yard performance he had a couple weeks ago. Uh, Bush on the, on the ground goes one for 79. That's a great average. Petaway, 4 for 35 and a touchdown. Sinkfield, 7 for 26. McCoy, 7 for 23. A lot of rushing attempts for Iowa State in this game. Very, very balanced down the roster. So this one looks like they just kind of ran through the gamut of the guys on their depth chart because this game was so one-sided. Just keep your guys fresh. Receiving, you had Sills go 5 for 139 and 2. Jennings, 3 for 102. That's all she wrote in that regard. That's that's great offense by West Virginia. I still don't know that they have quite the blue chips that OU and Texas will have, but you can't sleep on them. They are certainly more dangerous, and if you're overlooking them now because of their embarrassing performance a couple weeks ago, that's a mistake, and you're going to more than likely hurt as a result of that. Finally, we have Oklahoma hosting Kansas State, beating the snot out of them 51-14. This was a complete performance from Oklahoma don't look now but since Oklahoma fired uh, Mike Stoops they have now won in impressive fashion two weeks in a row the defense has held both of the previous two opponents TCU and now Kansas State granted neither is considered a high-powered offense right now uh, in the Big 12 but they've held both opponents under 275 total yards of offense I don't care who you're playing that's pretty that's pretty significant and they'll have a better test coming up for sure but they might be building something. Oklahoma's offense is still clicking at a high level. If they can get that defense sorted out now under Ruffin McNeil, they might really have something. They are the only team left in the Big 12 that has a real feasible shot at being in the college football playoff. Can they win anything in the playoff? I don't know. I still am very suspicious of this defense, and honestly, this offense doesn't feel, even though it's producing at a similar number clip, to what the last two years of Baker Mayfield did for them. I don't know that it's as good of an offense as they were last year, even though their receiving core is better just by way of age and overall balance uh, for guys like CeeDee Lamb and Hollywood Brown. But nevertheless, uh, Kansas State's quarterback Thompson goes 13 of 21 for 108 yards, no touchdowns. On the ground, he had seven for 54 and a touchdown. Silman goes 8 for 51. Here's something to keep in mind. Kansas State ran for over 300 yards on Baylor. They ran for something like 275 against Oklahoma State when they went to Stillwater and beat the snot out of them earlier this season. So it's a really interesting thing here that Oklahoma was able to take a team that its identity is based around its running attack. And against other teams in the Big 12, it has run all over them, and Oklahoma was able to hold them so much in check. 54 yards here, 51, 28, and 6. Those are the rushing uh, yards for individual players, for the four players that ran the ball for Kansas State. That's pretty impressive numbers to hold them under 150 total rush yards there. Uh, then you got on the receiving side, you got Schoen, Schoen going 4 for 47, Next closest guy is Knowles, 3 for 25. Yeah, Oklahoma's defense was smothering in this game. They seem to finally understand how to get off the field, and that's huge. Meanwhile, Kyler Murray, 19 of 24, 352, three touchdowns, no picks, no sacks. Uh, Brooks on the ground. Kennedy Brooks, the redshirt freshman, still tearing it up as a change of pace back. Goes 5 for 94, two touchdowns with a long of 86. Obviously, that's going to rip that average from a little gain or a respectable gain to huge numbers immediately. So that, that skews the stats for sure, because then you look at it and you say, okay, well, beyond that, he had four carries for eight yards. Regardless, the numbers are what they are. 
Pledger, 13 for 91. That's another running back that doesn't get much burn. Sermon, somehow still playing through a leg injury, 8 for 58. He was tearing it up on the ground, too. Kyler goes 5 for 46 and a touchdown. Sutton, 3 for 8. Even Austin Kendall, the backup quarterback, had 3 for 17. So Oklahoma's making it happen, man. C.D. Lamb, 4 for 160. Two touchdowns, including a long of 82. Grant Calcaterra, 2 for 57 and a touchdown. Now, something for Oklahoma to keep in mind, uh, Hollywood Brown is nursing a ankle, an, an ankle injury, I believe, and as a result, he hasn't quite been his usual self last couple weeks. Thankfully, Oklahoma's passing attack and their depth is keeping them afloat enough that they don't have to ask much, ask much of Hollywood, and that's allowed him to regroup a little bit. Hopefully, they can kind of get him closer back to 100% as they enter now the dire stretch of their attempt for a postseason push. I know that's kind of a wordy, stumbling, awkward way of putting that, but I stand by it because here I am and I'm still talking, apparently. Ending sentence. So, Big 12, a lot of action this past week. Texas, your big loser. Oklahoma State, your big winner just by means of getting the big upset. Oklahoma, your big winner for moving into first and doing so in dominant fashion. West Virginia, good bounce back. TCU, ooh, what the hell has happened to you? And this is just where we're at, man. We are we are in the thick of the push for the postseason here. And this is where it starts getting really exciting. This is where you're going to start getting the better matchups each week and where it's really, really going to come down to what's your team's health situation look like and what's your depth. All of this is going to be crucial moving forward. I can't wait to see where it goes. But that's all my time for this episode, guys. Thank you for tuning in. I've been DDP with the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Salute.